that I am the world's greatest teacher. So. Okay, so on Wednesday, I asked you, uh, as you were leaving, to uh, continue uh, over the next couple of days with your thoughts on starting with your birth and tracing backwards, and then coming up with some big social, political types of events or, or uh, milestones that would have impacted the way that your parents parented you, and then also begin to think from your birth moving forward, what are some events that you have actually lived through that might have impacted the way your parents parented you in the moment, but also potentially could impact the way that you will parent your own children someday. We use the uh, example of 9-11 as one of those big, major milestones that really changed the face of the parent-child relationship. If you remember, I talked about the idea of like security and the wooden privacy fence was something we, when my generation was growing up, we just didn't have those. Uh, but as um, terrorism kind of took root in the 90s and then in the early 2000s, and we had a couple of big events like that, uh, now they're everywhere. And so world safety filtered all the way down to personal family safety and security. And so I ask you to do that. So what I want you to do just for a couple of minutes is just uh, touch base with your group again. Then we're going to share those things. And then we're going to move uh, quickly on to a couple of other things and finish out that, uh, that chapter one worksheet that, uh, that you can do notes on. Cool? All right. So take a couple of minutes.
Thirty more seconds. Okay, let's start with the reporters in each group, uh, just talking about some things that your group talked about as far as looking back from the time that you were born, tracing the timeline back, what were uh, some events that you all talked about that were big social or political events that shaped parenting? And I don't care which group wants to go first. Of our parents' lives? Yeah, so tracing backwards from your birth, from when you were born, what were some big events? Uh, Maggie said uh, the cartel uh, in Colombia. Okay. And when Pablo Escobar was like big, her mom was really nervous and like impacted by that. Yeah. And then they said JFK uh, was a big one as well. So. Yeah. So yeah, even thinking about um, <coughs> JFK is interesting because like it, that happened before before I was born, but that definitely impacted my parents. My mom still talks about that and still talks about the feeling they had as a family when um, they got the news she was in school and, and they got the news similar to uh, similar to how I felt probably in 1995 when we got the news of the Oklahoma City bombing. Like it was just like dread and what comes next and those types of things. The, um, the cartel is, is fascinating and you, where your family is from Columbia, right? And so they were there in the middle of it. Your parents, yeah, wow. Um, yeah, so things that would not have really impacted my family, but are still big um, social political <coughs> events. Yeah, definitely. Anything else from your group that you talked about? I mean, I, I can always think of like the, the moon landing and stuff like that. Or some, like big events that happened. Like my dad was born on the day the moon, like they came back from the moon. So okay, yeah, cool. So yeah. yeah, stuff like that that maybe maybe reshapes. Uh, yeah, it doesn't all have to be negative, does it? Like uh, maybe it kind of reshapes hope. And wow, we're, we're going to blow up with technology, and yeah. we've landed on the moon. We can do anything. Yeah, definitely. All right, good job. Uh, whoever reported from whichever group. Um, so, we well, have yeah, obviously 9 11, because that was the general consensus. Uh, we also put Y2K, because that was, compared to some of the other things, that was probably kind of minor, but like, I mean, everyone thought the world was going to end. So, like, um, we also have the Cold War, because it lasted so long, and it kind of just made this spirit of like, trust no one. And then I think this is a little bit before any of our parents really put like a rise in crime and murders. We mentioned like Ted Bundy because of like serial killers and stuff. Yeah. Um, and then for, do you want after the fact? Maybe, okay, yeah. nice to before, sure enough. Yeah, so some good stuff in there. Y2K I hadn't even thought of, but yeah, that was, I mean, we did. I was I was a senior here. I, we, I remember it, we all thought, but we didn't know what to think. We didn't know what was gonna happen. We had been told that all of that, all technology was gonna just shut down and the world was just gonna freeze when when it hit midnight. And so it was the one New Year's Eve where I kind of remember like we were all kind of kind of trepidatious. Ten, nine, <laughs> eight, you know, hold on to each other, like what's gonna happen? Are all the bombs gonna go off? Is that what's gonna go on here? And then it was like, zero, happy <laughs> new year. Uh, it's still working. <laughs> like it's still, my flip phone still works. I don't know. And it was kind of a lackluster thing. But kind of leading up to that. But it also, I, I do can see where that might have shaped parenting because it was this, um, it was something that the whole world experienced and <clears throat> there was questioning and uh, centered around technology. And even still today, we, we, 
approach technology in unique ways in families that in part were probably did by that. Very cool. All right, y'all are up. Okay, so we have the civil rights movement. Um, we have Vietnam War, um, Oklahoma bombing, 9-11, Watergate, and the legal legalization of abortion. Okay, yeah, there's a lot going on there that <coughs> definitely impacted. And so really thinking about war um, there as well, and um, Vietnam, bombing, uh, a lot of those things around family security and those types of things. Um, uh, the, the whole idea with Watergate and you know, questioning, you know, can we even trust our government? And, and I mean, we're seeing seeing that now in the last few years, right? Like families that grew up in that time and maybe uh, have raised their kids to question that. Should we always, should we just follow the government 100%, no questions asked, or should we always question everything and what are the implications on family life? Either way you go with that. So yeah, I think that's, that's really good. And then that plays into certain policy, right? So uh, Roe v. Wade, the overturning of Roe, you know, here we are decades later, we're still wrestling with the same questions, dealing with the same issues, and how are they gonna impact families moving <coughs> forward, right? How are they gonna impact parenting? So what I want you to see from that, uh, we, we have to remember we're looking at parenting from two distinct lenses this semester. We're gonna, we're gonna look at the micro lens, we're gonna look from family to family. What does parent-child relationship look like? But we're also gonna look from a macro lens. We're gonna look, like, we're gonna look at parenting in a broader scope, you know, what impacts parenting, uh, what are some commonalities that uh, kind of are across culture when it comes to parenting. And then we can kind of zoom in and zoom out at multiple levels and come up with maybe a clear definition of what this whole parent-child relationship is supposed to be. So we, we get all of this, we, we understand there's these big world events that um, impact the way we parent. There's also very unique individual family events that impact the way that we parent and are parented. And so you may be able to think of some of those things within your own family. Um, when I was eight years old, I was walking beside my dad and he was hit by a car from behind. Think that impacted parenting? Yeah, it definitely did, it definitely did. Um, so there's gonna be things like that, those random events, but also like personality. I am very extroverted and outgoing, and uh, I'm a seven on the Enneagram, if you follow that, very much a seven. My little sister is the exact opposite of me. She's quiet, she's shy, she's introverted, she doesn't, um, uh, she doesn't like to be, she doesn't want to be on stage. She wants to be in the audience. She loves cheering people on, but she's not going to be on the stage, right? So we're just totally different. Our parents parented us different in part because of our personalities and who we are. Does that make, does that make sense? I also am a male. My sister is a female. They parent us different not just because of our personalities but because of uh, how we identify, right? Uh, things that, that we are, uh, into um, related to how we identify beyond gender, how we identify uh, in career and in politics and in theology and just name it all. Like we, we are different people and we are parented differently. My <coughs> mom parents us much differently than my father does. The, Best example of that is my mom is a night owl. I got that from her. I hate mornings. I hate mornings. 
Like when you all gripe that a 10 a.m. class is too early, I feel you. <laughs> like all classes should be between one and three. That's it. Uh, I, I get that. My dad, early morning riser. Hated that. When I was younger, in order to have quality time with my mom and my dad, where it was just us, when I would get home at night, I knew my mom was going to be up no matter what time it was. Um, and it wasn't because she was waiting up for me, it's just because she was up. And so my mom and I would have some of our deepest, most heartfelt, best conversations uh, at midnight. And then I would get up at 5.30 in the morning and drink coffee with my dad because I knew that that's when um, I could really connect with him. Now, sometimes those were deep, heartfelt conversations, but sometimes it was dad talking to me going, yeah, yeah, give me that cup of coffee, <laughs> right? I'll be with you in a few hours. Uh, but they're different people too, and so they parent differently because of who they are. And then there's the whole system of mom and dad together in my house, and so there's mom parenting and dad parenting, and then there's this parent subsystem where they parent as one, and that's different than either individual. And so we've got this micro lens, and we've got this macro lens, and sometimes we combine that with where we are in um, explaining parenting, and things get really, really confusing. Because, ah, switch. I want you to think about this. Right now, right now, there are more than 42,000 parenting books on the shelves. And when I say 42,000, I'm talking contemporary parenting books. So parenting books that have been written within uh, the last decade or a little more. 42,000 different books on parenting. And you live in the age of uh, the internet where things are literally at your fingertips. There are millions, millions of internet articles. In fact, if you go into the Google search engine and just type parenting, you will get millions of hits. And those things may be articles from uh, consumer types of magazines or newspapers, things that you just buy over the counter. Those things may be research articles. Those things may be chat rooms. They may be blog posts. They may be social media posts. There's millions of things about parenting. Then we get into television. There are educational shows on parenting. There are reality shows on parenting. There are some things like uh, Nanny 911. Anybody ever seen that? Or Super Nanny? You guys remember those shows? There's uh, the show that I uh, was telling you about that we're going to watch some clips of. I actually watched uh, part of an episode last night called The Parent Test. Um, just it's mind blowing. Uh, so we've got all of these. We've got all of these connections to parenting and what is parenting. And, you know, we still have print media and textbooks and all of those types of things. And we get to this question, okay, we know parenting looks different on a micro level from family to family. And we know that parenting is affected at a macro level by all of these big world events. And there's everything in between. And we know that there are literally a million plus different places we can go to find information on parenting. So how do we know what is the most credible source? How do we know that? Talk about it. you got one minute. Talk about it. Give your reporter an answer to give the rest of us. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Subjective. Yeah. Isn't it about degrees to separate? All right, here we go. Let's start up here with this group. Give us an answer to the question. How do we know what is the most credible source? So we think that the objective answer is like who has the degrees, who studied the material. But we also know that parenting is so different for everyone that a lot of credibility person to person is going to be subjective. Okay. Um, and so if if someone if someone's life more closely resembles like someone writing a blog, then they're going to be like, Well, I trust these people because they, they look like me and they believe what I believe. So I don't know about that parenting book over there, but this sounds right to me, so it's okay. going to be subjective. Yeah, so perhaps this whole phenomena of parenting is uh, subject to both objective and subjective truth. And that's the weird thing for a lot of us, because we don't want both objective and subjective truth. Okay, I like that answer. Back here. So we thought like researchers who have done the studies, or like even parents with firsthand experiences um, reading their stuff, but um, how each kid is different, you wouldn't want to read something about like an extrovert child and you have an introvert child. You want to find something that actually fits what you're looking for and fits your situation, um, whether that's from a parent who has been in the same book and they are writing about it, um, take advice from them, or researchers who have also done some studies and kind of know what they're talking about, but at the same time you can be like a researcher and never have been a parent and you're just going with like what the results or like stats say. So. Yeah. Yeah, and so, yeah, in that sense, we're, we're emphasizing experience, especially in unique situations. Um, whether, whether we have been able to research that situation or we just know other parents who have experienced a similar situation, then uh, experience matters. Yeah, okay, I believe that too. Uh, we said very similar things where, like, it kind of depends on what you're looking for or, like, your style of parenting. So the ex experiences that people have that you're reading from, um, we talked about like experts probably have more credibility than some just random person off the street that's never had a kid or ever parented. Um, but we, we said a lot of it just depends on like how you parent, what you're looking for, like who you deem as credible. Yeah. 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 So some of it's, again, we're kind of back to that objective and subjective truth. We're, we're back to what do I... What do I think and what do I believe? And how does that line up with what I'm seeing and reading? And so there's this weird mishmash of all of that. Uh, you said something that reminded me of, of a great story I was in. Uh, where was I? I was in Minnesota uh, once at a National Council on Family Relations Conference. And I had uh, a poster with me. I was doing a research presentation on um, and some research we had done on fathering. And I was on the train uh, heading to the, to the hotel, and uh, there was a, a, a Minnesota native on the train, and he looked at me, and he said, what's that? And I said, oh, it's a poster uh, research I've been doing. I'm presenting it at a conference. And he said, well, what's your research about? And he said, father. And he, said, he said, what do you mean? Like, are you for fathers or against fathers? Like, what are you trying to do? And I, so I tried to explain what I was doing, and he said, and where are you going? And I told him, going to this family conference. And he said, you need a conference to tell you how to be a family? <laughs> and he said, no, that's not, that's not what it is. Um, then I got to thinking, I was like, yeah, that's kind of what it is. So, uh, and it just reminded me of that, like, this man didn't need my research to define fathering for him. Didn't need a conference to define family for him. Uh, and yet, uh, I was going there with what I felt to be a pretty credible piece of research, right? So, yeah, and, uh, some of it's just going to be how do we in internalize it. And so I think all of those answers are correct, but I think for us, we want to focus on this. We want to focus on the need for research. I love me, and I love my opinions, and I love you and your opinions, but I also love science. Uh, and I am a scientist, and I think that we can learn a lot about this phenomenon called parenting by studying it, by researching it. 
And so I think we have a need for good, quality, systematic, empirical research. Uh, this research can correct some beliefs that may be uh, kind of out there, kind of erroneous. Uh, it can um, also give us new understanding and insight into parenting. Uh, the U.S. will talk about this as we talk about culture and, and different things. The U.S. is a melting pot culture, right? Uh, that has been heavily dominated in media and in research uh, by European-American uh, families, families that look similar to mine. And yet, we're in a time where the two largest minority groups are uh, about to equal the size of the majority group, which means the face of parenting uh, is changing because... Parenting in African-American families and in Latino families, in a lot of ways, has some very unique characteristics from European Anglo-American families. And so we can learn new things about parenting by studying it. We can also learn how cultures blend together and how parenting changes as uh, the, the world acculturates. Um, parenting research is not new. We've been studying parenting for a long time. Uh, some of the earliest landmark studies were in the 1940s. Um, family science as a whole was really beginning to uh, grow and build uh, during the, the 30s and 40s, uh, the 1900s. Baldwin, Calhoun, and Breeze in 1945 uh, their research put forth the idea of child rearing and competency, the idea that how we parent our children is directly related to how competent they are as adults, their ability to function in society. That's pretty interesting. Sears and Maccabee and Levin in 1957 looked at. Uh, Mothers and really put forth this idea for maybe the first time that there are a variation of maternal practices. That mom's mother in unique ways from father, yes, but also mom's mother uh, in a variety of different ways to accomplish specific goals. And so that's a, a landmark uh, case as well. Something that we'll pay a lot of attention to in here is Dr. Baumrein's studies where uh, we, uh, she labeled parenting types. In fact, uh, we'll briefly get into that next week, but the week after next, we'll spend a lot of time with Dr. Baumrein's parenting styles. Um, and that's really, uh, the establishment of those typologies has really changed the way we look at parenting. And we still use her types to talk about um, quote-unquote, good parenting and bad parenting. And so research is not new when it comes to the parent-child relationship. We've been doing it for a while, but we continue to learn new things. We also, even in our objective spaces, disagree. One of the biggest disagreements that we can think of in the parent-child relationship research is with discipline. There's a whole line of research that talks about uh, the... Uh, the negatives of things like corporal punishment uh, versus the positives of things like positive parenting. And on one side of the aisle, you have those who will say, we must discipline with corporal punishment. That spanking is good. And on the other side of the aisle, we see researchers saying, no, Spanking is never the best option. It's never the right thing. It's not good. And we have actually have research uh, that supports both sides. And so even in that, we have to kind of think about things. We're going to do some stuff uh, in a couple of weeks where we'll look at this idea of discipline and what it is, and we'll, we'll dive more into, we'll dive more into that research and just kind of think about it. 
When we think about where we are now, though, with research and, and what's important, uh, there are some big federal studies, national studies that are going on, the national children's study. These are big longitudinal studies that are following children and families over long periods of time. Um, the National Children's Studies looking at, looks at 100,000 different children uh, across 98 different locations in the United States. And so we're getting a wide breadth of information about how children are being reared and what's going on and why is that important. And we're able to look at differences between those locations. How does parenting look in New York City versus uh, Luther, Oklahoma. Probably a little different, right? Probably a little different. Uh, we also have journals that are devoted specifically to the whole idea of parenting. There is uh, a really good parenting journal, research journal, Parenting Science and Practice. Um, and then uh, we also have uh, source books that summarize parenting research. And so actually the Handbook of Parenting um, uh, the 2002 citation that I have up there is, is from an earlier edition. I believe the, the latest edition was published in 2019, and, and it's a multi-volume source that just, it, it, all it is, I think I have an early volume in my office if you want to come by and look at it, and it's like five different volumes of the Handbook of Parenting, and it's just a collection of parenting research and ideology up to that point. And it's fascinating, right? And so we have, we have this collection and, and we are ongoing with research. And so I want you to be excited about that. I want you to engage that because we're going to, we're going to do that this semester. We're going to engage some of that research. Uh, we're going to look at some things, contemporary themes. Parents are concerned about how best to rear their children. This is a theme that is not a new theme. This is a reason why there are millions of different hits when you search parenting on the internet. Because parents are interested. I have a PhD in this stuff. I research fathering. I study a unique parenting style, uh, parenting characteristic of families and disabilities. And there are times when I have to search for things because I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. No idea. I have a son who is amazing and awesome and I love him very much, but that boy does not understand the word no. And we've tried everything, it feels like. So we're always asking people, okay, what haven't we tried yet? What haven't we tried yet? We got to try something because this is crazy. This kid's just, he's his own little dude right now. And we don't know what to do. He runs away. He won't listen. He does this. He does that. How do we con control that behavior? How do we modify that behavior? Right? Parents want to know. And it's a good thing. And I think for some of us, that's where we're going to be able to come in as experts and say, hey, here's. Here's some generalities of parenting. Here's some things that can help you. Here's some, here's some research that actually supports this parenting trait or this style or this um, event. And I think that'll be a good thing. Uh, other things that uh, are going to be themes through this class. Child rearing can improve child children's well-being. Child rearing can improve children's well-being. There is a phrase that you are going to say... Uh, once we get into the stages of development uh, and parenting children at different ages, you're going to say this phrase over and over. So I'm going to give it to you now because I want you to memorize it. I'm going to come back to it a lot. And you're going to say it a lot over the course of the semester. In fact, you're going to say it so much that something with you in a few years is going to happen like happened just a couple of days ago when I was working on parent-child presentation and Be Real came on and I had to do a Be Real and so it was my face on one side and it was my computer screen on the other side and it, it was the parent-child, uh, I think it was the syllabus, I had the parent-child syllabus and one of my alums immediately 
got on and said the phrase I'm about to, to say to you. And I was like, yes. It's been like seven years since she was in Parent Child and she still remembers it. Uh, so for us, we are going to say that the primary purpose of parenting is to keep the child healthy and safe. Primary purpose of parenting is to keep the child healthy and safe. And so then I would say something to you like this. Hey class, the primary purpose of parenting is what? Keep the child healthy and safe. You all said that super loud, like much louder than most parent-child classes in the past. And there's less of you. That's really good. I'm going to do it one more time because I feel good about this. Hey class, what's the primary purpose of parenting? To keep the child healthy and safe. Oh my goodness, you guys are so great. I love it. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we're keeping the child healthy and safe. And I think that is important for us because child rearing can improve children's well being. There are certain aspects of child rearing that we engage in that do keep the children healthy and safe and make them well. And I, I love that. I love that. And there are things that parents can engage in that lessen the likelihood of health and safety. And we want to avoid some of those things. So we'll, we'll look at that. Another theme is that parents are eager to learn. I see this all the time. I have yet to meet uh, an overwhelming number of parents that would say to me, I have nothing to learn about this. I have everything figured out. We're doing wonderful. Even some of the most together families that I have ever seen jump headfirst into some parenting seminars that I've done. And it surprises me, because I'm like, oh wow, I thought you would be teaching me some things. And they're like, nope. All of a sudden, we have no idea what we are doing. In fact, a lot of people look at Lisa and I as these types of parents. Uh, they, sometimes people are surprised to know that we struggle at times with how we're supposed to parent our children, right? We do. Uh, but there's been multiple times where I've been like, don't know, textbook says this, handbook on parenting says this, Josiah won't do any of it, <laughs> I don't know what to do. We want to learn. More times than not, parents are eager to learn. And then finally, uh, we've kind of hit on this, how we child rear, the beliefs about child rearing, and parent, child rearing and parenting, they shift over time. And they shift both at the micro level. I do not parent my children today the way that I did 10 years ago. I don't parent 13-year-old Lydia like I did 3-year-old Lydia. My parents don't parent 45-year-old Bobby like they did 14-year-old Bobby. So micro, it shifts over time, but also macro. Those things we did in the last class period where we looked at kind of the evolution of, oh, children are born as just little balls of sin, and we should just beat them until they're saved, right? To, no, they're born as, as blank slates. There's nothing to them, and we just have to mold them in the way that they're going to go. To uh, maybe more of a contemporary idea of, Children are born, not just as blank slates, but they're born um, innocent. And uh, our job is to protect them, to keep them healthy and safe, healthy and safe as we are molding them and, and they are being molded by society as well. Right? So all of that is going to shift over time and all of that is important for us uh, to study. So... Come back to you to end the class. We've had two weeks now where we have just kind of introduced this whole idea of parenting. Where are you at? What questions do you have? How do you feel? Let's start with the feeling. How do you feel right now? How do you feel about what we're talking about, where we're going, all of that? I almost feel excited, kind of, because I've seen the way my parents have parented me and how they've parented my sisters, and just to see how my friends are parented and how it all kind of differs. Yeah. 
And I'm just excited to like learn more about that and really understand it. Cool. Good. I'm glad you're excited. I cannot wait till first order day. It's my favorite day. <laughs> spring break, right before spring break. I think, yeah, I know we have one only child. Are there any other only children in here besides Sue? Okay, good. That'll be fun. That'll be so much fun. Somebody else, one more. How are you feeling? Um, I feel like it's pretty interesting just to see all the different parenting styles. Like the philosophers, some think that children are born sinful or to discipline, not to discipline. And let them learn on their own or to teach them guide them. So it's just pretty cool to see all the different viewpoints. Yeah, just kind of look and see. what, and, and also just to see, okay, how was someone parented different than I was? And they, they turned out okay, right? Uh, yeah, some, some really cool things here. Uh, all right. I, I hope that you maintain some excitement. I want you to be excited uh, in this class. On Blackboard, or on your syllabus, it says uh, that you're supposed to be reading chapters two and three for next week, which is about theory and research. Yes, but it also says there's a Blackboard reading. That was a, a misprint. The Blackboard reading isn't until the next week. So all your reading over the weekend for next week is chapter two and chapter three, theory and research. We are, I especially want you to read chapter three in great detail, make notes, do that, work with your group on how you want to take notes on that chapter, because we will not spend much time at all in class talking about research. We'll do that in other courses. We are going to spend a lot of time next week diving into theory. We're going to do a lot in class to uh, unwrap and explain these theories through activity rather than me lecturing theory to you because as much as I love theory, no one else does. And if you try to lecture theory and not explain theory with fun, then trust me, by Monday at 10, 15, you're gonna be like, why did I come to this class? And all the excitement that you're talking about now will be gone. And so I'm not gonna deflate that from you. So read chapter two and three, really pay attention to your note taking on chapter three be ready to dive into some of these theoretical perspectives and how we understand the parent-child relationship uh, through activities in class. And then my final thing is, bless you, because we only, because we had kind of a short week and we're still trying to figure this out, I want you to keep your, uh, I want you to keep your roles in your groups the same for next week. And we'll do our first group evaluation where you will evaluate yourself and your group we'll do our first one next friday so we kind of are getting a feel for it this week um, in the shortened week next week we'll have our first full week of those and we'll evaluate everything on friday sound good all right y'all are awesome have a wonderful weekend